straight from the farm. And very unusual for me, I've got, uh, because it's about art, I thought I'd show you some pretty pictures. So I'm going to be using tools and interfacing with a computer. So this can only be painful for me. Before, and you in return. Before I commence, however, I think it only appropriate that um, I pay respect to our elders past. Um, David Duffy, I hope you're watching. Um, and pay respect to uh, elders present. What a pleasure it's going to be to share a forum with Professor Ian Benson. It's the, uh, the, the best tag team fight, uh, I think, uh, since the Macho Man Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan formed the mega powers in 1988, um, except possibly at the opposite end of, of the cultural spectrum. Um, tonight, essentially, I, I want to do three things with you and hope I've got time enough to do it. We'll get the hard thinking up front, everyone ready to do a bit of brain work and get the grey cells pumping, do some heavy thinking, we'll do that up front, then we'll look at the pretty pictures, do a bit of Bob Ross, you know, and look at some beautiful pictures to make us feel good. And then I'll see if I can explain how all that stuff that sounds straight out of a book it can be applied in your everyday life and what you can do rather than just listen to it and say, well, that sounds very nice. What can you do with your own actions in five minutes from leaving that door that will be a step in the right direction? That's, if you like, what I've got to say. Um, you might want to run the other way, you know, depending upon how you feel. Okay. Art. Beauty. There's an expression that you often hear tossed about when people talk about art, and that is, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, which everyone assumes means that value judgments are subjective. But they're actually misinterpreted what that expression means because it actually means the exact opposite. That expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, should be understood as in order to perceive beauty, the possibility to conceive of it must already reside in the eye of the person looking at it. Otherwise, there will not be a meeting of beauty and the beholder. That's what it means. It's not a statement of subjectivity at all. It's the ultimate statement of objectivity. And we have to start understanding these things and putting them into practice because at the moment, what I see too often for, for traditionalists and, and from conservatives is they talk about, oh, look at this art, isn't it terrible? Oh, this thing looks like a squashed dog turd. Oh, isn't it, isn't it silly? Oh, it's so woke. And they laugh at it and they make jokes about it. But that's it. They don't do anything about it. They think, oh, I voted for the Liberal Party in the last election. I'll let them take care of it. Well, good luck with that. Nothing ever changes. The march through the institutions, the erosion of culture continues unabated because all you've done is point and laugh at it. The person on Sky News just points and laughs and goes, oh, oh, how woke, and then moves on to the next topic. In the meantime, all that stuff fills your galleries. It's important to understand that when beauty is in the eye of the beholder, what we need to be doing is getting that concept of beauty, that notion of an objective truth, and making sure it resides in more eyeballs. That's the object of the exercise. So when we look at notions of objectivity and, and beauty, or objectivity generally, uh, we, we come across it in a number of ways. Some people, their first thought is Plato and the, the, the idea of there being pure forms of which um, we usually only have refractions and we have to sort of strive towards the light. Some people think of Burke and the sublime and the beautiful, which is um, a big debate about Burke because he relied a lot upon Locke and a certain way of understanding senses and input of information. But if you look at the, the totality of Burke's work and where he was going, particularly with the sublime, he was talking about um, the idea of there being objective truths 
the the sublime, which is something that uh, is very paternal. He actually gave them gender. <gasps> Uh, the sublime is a paternal thing, it's fatherly, it's distant, it's authoritative, it reminds us of death, it reminds us indeed of God. Whereas beauty is the maternal, it is warm, it is something that um, uh, puts us in, in the place of objective love. Uh, it's maternal uh, like the mother of God, it is maternal like Mary, it is those... Uh, warming eyes that, that, that we, we picture when we say, uh, pray for us uh, now and at the moment of our death. But tonight, I want to have a look at um, Eric Vogelin uh, because he's difficult and I think that's marvellous. And I think that, that if you get even a 10% grasp on where he was going, it's going to do all of us a world of good. Some of you who've seen me speak before may remember I, I talked about this notion of the metaxi, which is a, a, a term borrowed from Plato. But essentially what Vogelin is saying is that humanity is in a position of tension. And it's like he uses a metaphor of poles, and, he, and he's quite clear to say, look, this is a metaphor, I have, have no mistake, um, where there is the divine and there's the mundane, and... Humanity is held in a state of tension between the two uh, and shouldn't strive to be either, but rather can, uh, either pole, but should be content with their position, as purgatorial as that may feel. And in our society today, of course, what we have is a situation where there are far too many people trying to become their own God because they have become completely and utterly materialistic and see the existence of life as being entirely material and having absolutely no transcendental component to it. And there are deformations that occurred as a result of that. So I thought, if I can, very quickly... So I've already written some stuff about this, so I thought I'll do something I very rarely do, and that is I will read through with you a small segment of some of the ideas that I've put in place using Vogelin and T.S. Eliot, and I'll see if what I've just said makes sense and develops a fuller picture to you. Um, because how you conceive of the transcendental and its importance is the key to defending and appreciating proper beauty and the sublime in art because art is that fundamental a function of our existence as human beings. I look here at this notion of timelessness. Timelessness is important to conservatives, the idea of a timeless moment. Um, and art is really supposed to capture timeless moments when we are captivated and caught up in the moment of art, we are in fact meant to be experiencing a timeless moment. So the two are intimately related. So I say here, whilst timelessness is something most often experienced by individuals, others are collective and not private. In Eliot's Christian worldview, T.S. Eliot, the moments of Annunciation and Incarnation of Christ are profound examples of such moments. They are public and historic. During the discussion upon the ongoing relevance of classical literature, Eliot broadened his critique from literature to one of the ideology of the age. And he said, in our age, when men seem more than ever prone to confuse wisdom with knowledge, knowledge with information, and try to solve problems of life in terms of engineering, there is coming into existence a new kind of provincialism which perhaps deserves a new name. Russell Kirk gave him one. After reading that passage, Kirk says, this new provincialism is one of time. The collective timeless moments and recognition of them are, are a means of breaking this provincialism. In other words, having once again a community of 
participation and perception where the community is aware that there is an objective truth and seeks to see it and understand it and find it and seeks guidance from a hierarchy around them instead of imposing their own values and emotions and all the things that are about me and the I and turn their mind to the we and the objective um, uh, reality of truth. Eliot's perceptions of time are to be discerned from his poetry. They are not explicit in his uh, prosaic works, but do read um, uh, the idea of a Christian society and notes towards the definition of culture. Um, Vogelin, uh, a scholar, Eugene Webb, he notes that the dominant theme of the four quartets is the problem of the relationship between time and eternity, which, as the poem presents it, is a version of the problem of the relationship between the secular and the sacred. It is worth remembering in this connection that the Latin cyclum, the root of the English secular, means an age or generation and by extension the world of time. The problem, as the cortex pose it, is that from a point of view within time, time seems an endless cyclical flux, while man's only access to a sacred dimension of experience seems to be in timeless moments that are isolated with no before and after. For man to leave the two as separate is to be torn in two, since his natural life is rooted in the temporal world, while his longing for the sacred, if we really believe in an absolute truth, if we really believe in a divinity, if we really believe in the sacred, then surely it must call to us, because it wants us reunited with it in an act of perfection of love at some point. So if we really believe in these things, then we have to accept that there is some mechanism by which one calls to the other. So, getting back to uh, Webb's comment, he says, uh, since his natural life is rooted in the temporal world, while his longing for the sacred is like an intolerable shirt of flame, that's borrowed from Eliot's poetry, that he cannot remove. But to unite them requires a lifetime's death in bewildering minutes in which we are all very much alike, that men and women come nearest to being real. We see here the contrast of two moments. One, an implied timelessness that is spiritual and pertains to the tension of human existence. The other, temporal, measured in minutes, but vaporous. And that is one of the things that Eliot constantly tried to address in his poetry. He, he was suggesting when he talks about life dissolving like coffee spoons or uh, will I wear my trousers rolled, do I dare eat a peach? All these things are about the, 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 the vaporousness of, of being caught up in an, in an arrow of time as opposed to appreciating the transcendental in timeless moments. But of course, what happens with Vogelin? Vogelin says, well... The problem we have is that when we articulate the transcendental, when we are, try and articulate this perfect truth, we use symbols because they're the only thing available to us to try and re-engender in another person what we've had engendered in us when we have a transcendental, timeless moment where it's like time stops, it's no longer there. We've, we've, we're witnessing truth it has touched us in some form. Uh, the, the, the transcendent has manifested uh, uh, to us in some way. Uh, we talk in symbols. We use symbols. We paint symbols. We talk through pictures and we talk through sounds and, and onomatopoeia and all these things. But what can happen is a, a symbol can start to lose its meaning when instead of being content in that metaxi, in that position between 
two poles wearing your shirt of flame, you start to pull one way or the other. And in our society, we see the material and the ditching of the transcendental. So symbols now, instead of being a way of communicating these timeless moments in the transcendental, instead of doing that, they take on an ideological dimension and they become a form of ideology as opposed to a traditional means of conveying a transcendent moment from one person to another. Are you all following or am I going too hard, too high, too fast? We're happy? Okay. So what, what Vogel warns us of is he says, look, there, there's an essay called Experience a Symbol where, where he sets all this out and it's a poor ancient Egyptian contemplating suicide that, that prompted him uh, to, to examine this and, and write about it is the degree to which the neglect of symbols can cause the society around you to degenerate. Because what happens is this, and this is, this is something Vogel, I won't go into too much detail about this because I really feel I'll be overloading too much, but what, what Vogel says is sometimes what happens is somebody wakes up, somebody will realise, because there's that always that call, don't forget if it's real, it's calling to us. There's that call and someone hears it in the darkness of their secular, time-bound, totally materialist, mundane world, and they will feel as if they're falling. Someone's saying up the back there, sounds like Heidegger, not today, some other time. <laughs> But people feel like they're falling. And what they will often prefer is to retreat back to the illusion rather than confront the reality of life's actual existence of being caught in attention, of having to wear that shirt of flame as the reality of existence. That's the nature of the human condition. Everyone seen The Matrix? Yes? Lots of nodding. And there's a scene with Cypher where it's like, we need someone to be the Judas here. And Cypher says, it's me because I just don't want to know anymore. I want to eat a steak. He says, I want to know what it's like to eat a steak. Put me back in The Matrix. I came out I saw the horror, I saw the rap, and I want to live in an illusion. I want to go there because I'm terrified by what I see. And you will be terrified by what you see if you do not have a society and a structure and tradition and hierarchy and a network of access to faith around you to help maintain you in your personal struggle with the metaxi, with the nature of the human condition. Because a well-ordered commonwealth constitutes, is constituted of well-ordered souls. But in order to have a well-ordered soul, it really helps to have a well-ordered commonwealth around you. So I, I fear that if I delve into that any more, I'm going to, I'm going to overload, and I'm, what I need to do is to show you how this relates to art. I'm not going to go showing you all the early medieval stuff, etc. I want to I just jump straight into the stuff where we see the tension at work, where we see um, people struggling with the human condition. Because once you, once you enter the Renaissance, yes, the Renaissance produces great art, it produces beautiful art, but what it shows you is the beginning of the struggle where the path towards materialism begins and humanism steps to the fore and people are starting to um, 
forsake their symbols of the sacred um, for more mundane things. Let's have a look at this. This one here, I'll just get my little list out. Anyone know who the, uh, who the artist there is? No? It's... Uh, Dutch artist. Velasquez. Oh, Velasquez. Yes. Um, this particular piece is known as the Water Cellar, uh, 1622. What you might notice about this picture, he, he did a, a particular style of art, Spanish term, which escapes me at the moment, but it, it, it's essentially a kind of um, uh, art that examines the life of everyday people in, in, in the street, and it was very popular in its day. But what you notice here is something quite special. I hope you can see that the exchange between the water seller and the boy directly mimics a boy receiving communion from a priest. There is a definite image and symbol there of the cup of Christ in the glass, the facial expressions, the mannerism of the water seller, even his apparel is representative of something which in 1622 would have been extremely familiar to all who observed it. And what Velázquez has not forgotten is that the sacred exists in the everyday. What he hasn't forgotten is that this symbol here in the very middle of the picture, that's slightly off-centre, is really reminding us about a particular sacrifice and a particular form of love that is being expressed between the water seller and the boy. So, even though this... What we have in 1622 is somebody um, depicting everyday scenes but placing the sacred very much in the centre of frame and relying on the fact that there is a communal act, not just communion, but a communal act taking place where people view the picture in that everybody's thinking the same thing and interprets the same transcendental meaning into that act and gets the same meaning out of it. Here, we see the rebellious um, William Blake in 1795 putting Isaac Newton at the bottom of the ocean, completely and utterly dumbfounded with all his mathematical genius to explain the world because he can't. What Blake is, yeah, and, and Blake was by no means a, your standard uh, Christian thinker at all. He was, he was quite out there, it was our William. Um, a romantic, uh, totally, you, you couldn't categorise him if you tried. Um, he, he probably had a, a few things that, that would see him diagnosed in, in today's terms. But in this picture, what you see is somebody who's very cognizant of the limitations of science and materialism and putting it on for everybody to see. And anyone who saw that picture in 1795 might have had a bit of a chuckle, Isaac Newton, ha, 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 but they would have recognised exactly what he was trying to say, which was that the dimension of the sacred has a valuable place even in the midst of the Industrial Revolution because the material cannot solve and will not solve all of our problems. Here, one of my favourites, Caspar David Friedrich, um, in the, the, the monastery graveyard under snow in 1818, is making a very deliberate point. What he's telling us here is that by this stage, we're in the ninth, early part of the 19th century now, the material has made massive inroads into European culture and the sacred here is literally in ruins, but it still functions. It is still being used. It, there are only pieces of it left, but yet the monks still, still enter it 
as a functioning church and treat it with the sacredness that it deserves. The, we are reminded of the Trinity in the centre of the frame. One, two, three. Windows, no glass, but the light of the painting coming through, which is um, Friedrich's way of saying that the eye of God is always watching and that the source of the transcendent is always there. You can't destroy it. You can smash the buildings. You can destroy the civilization even, but you can't destroy the absolute truth. It resides and it stays. It is imperishable. And that's what he tells us. But he tells us more because you'll notice the trees encircling the ruins. And the trees, of course, are part of the congregation. The trees here are like the... the the wisdom of the ages, they, they are tradition, they are the congregation of the generations past. Um, as Edmund Burke said, traditions are about the words of unlettered men. You know, they, these are the sort of unlettered men sort of standing there, um, taking part in this religious experience, but also partly like guardians. It's almost like what Friedrich is saying is that we have to place more faith in tradition because it lasts for a long time too. It's not, it's not imperishable, but it can withstand a lot of punishment and it's there, it's there for you to retreat to in times of extreme materialism to keep going. Um, how am I going for time? I don't want to take up too much of it. Right. Still, still good? I'd say so. All right. Let's have a look at one of my favourite romantic artists who was a screaming revolutionary in uh, Delacroix, Eugene Delacroix. What you see here, you probably recognise the scene, it's Christ calming the Sea of Galilee, or is he? You see all the different reactions of people in the boat, uh, from panic to insouciance to... Um, uh, people trying to be very pragmatic about things, but what you notice, though, is that Christ is asleep. He hasn't woken up yet and said, stop panicking, I'll solve this. Christ is certainly confident, but I don't think Delacroix is confident. And this is what you see in the Romantic Age. This is what you see in this fellow who was kind of a bit of a fan of the revolution, you know, he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't against the French Revolution at all, which is probably why the Ramsey Centre uses some of his artists there as their banner advertising. <laughs> That's what I do if I call myself conservative, stick something about the French Revolution. Um, anyway, um, what you see here with Delacroix is you see his doubt in this picture. The materialism of the promise of the revolution, we can be our own gods and solve our own problems, causing him doubt. The sea is calm towards the mountain or island in the background. Christ is still asleep, and Eugene Delacroix is making up his mind. What you see, I'll skip that picture for the sake of time, and I'll show you... Um, this one here. You probably haven't seen that one before. It's um, by a fellow called Hesselbaum, who's a, a Swede, um, and uh, it's called Ceremony at uh, Spunga Church, set in winter. But there's something about this picture that I think is quite striking. He was a religious man. Um, his parents were missionaries, if I'm not mistaken. And he studied um, a certain amount of theology. Despite the fact that it's winter, there is an unmistakable warmth that exudes from that picture. And where the warmth comes from in that picture is not just the way in which he employs colour and introduces sort of a yellow tone to complement the white, implying a kind of warmth of, a, of light, it's from the people in the picture. What you see there is a community with the sacred 
at its heart and soul. You see the interaction between the couple and the older man. You see the families uh, interacting with each other outside the church gates and uh, with a certain degree of sacredness, walking as family groups towards the church for a communal activity. Over to the left-hand side of the picture, you will see a person by a cross, which is clearly a grave, implying there, of course, that this notion of community extends beyond the living to the dead as well. The whole idea of the, the democracy of the dead, if you will. Um, in this picture, in a world thoroughly ensnared in doubt, what are we talking about? Um, 18, 1884, I think it is. Um, 1884, well into the 19th century, well into an age of materialism. Um, in a few years' time, there'll be a massive world war. And what we see in this piece of art is someone who is very cognizant of the need for recognition of the sacred and displays it through the use of symbols that, um, that speak to us in ways that words cannot, that words can't. Um, but of course, you, you need to be part of that language in order to share the experience. The average person today, but don't forget, the, a lot of these paintings were, were designed so that the common people could look at them and understand what was being said straight away. That is especially true of medieval art. Whereas today, you'd have to sit a school kid down and try and explain it to them over the course of an hour if you could. They'd struggle to grasp the first symbols in that painting, and that's a problem. Let's do one last one to compare and contrast. I might do a couple actually compared to the trust. Check this one out. Worn out um, by, um, um, I'll think of it in a moment. Um, Brenda Kilder, I think it is. Yeah, Brenda Kilder. Hans Anderson, Brenda Kilder. But related to Hans Christian, it's a similar friends to that. Revolutionary, given away by the red colouring that the woman is wearing. And She's not crying, she's angry, she's shouting, she's shouting to the side of the picture. She's angry at something. This is, be under no illusion, this is a, a painting about revolution. It is a painting about the circumstances of the ages. It's a painting about the, the costs of industrialization, the barren wasteland that used to be the farm, the farm that should be retired, probably dead on the ground, worn out. It's an angry painting, and the painter is angry, and he he's not being particularly sacred in this picture, but the way in which he has portrayed the, the people and the relationship and the way in which uh, we see the landscape still talks in symbols that we can understand and that are anchored in that language of the sacred that we understand. In those poles of tension, this artist is being pulled strongly in the materialist direction. He's being pulled, but he can still see that centre metaxi from his position. But a very famous artist was very impressed by this painting, very much so. And you can see it. Here, Edvard Munch, you would recognise the screen. And here you see that that situation I described of people who recognise the pull and the metaxi and see it for what it is and fall. Because Munch is literally looking at the age around him and going, ah! He was walking along a bridge with a couple of planks at sunset and he fell apart. And here it is, there's about four versions of this. Now it's very recognisable, yes, and it still speaks to us like it does. We, we look at it and we see this, yeah, I can relate to that. I can relate to this sort of feeling of helplessness and, and feeling like all I can do is scream I'm lost. But look at how. Look at how the symbolism has uh, degenerated in other ways. 
uh, we're, we're not looking at a human anymore, we're looking at a ghoul, we're looking at, at, uh, at something that is misshapen, that is deformed, that is no longer recognisably human, at least externally. What we see, though, is an emotion, a strong emotion. It's, it's a story of personal psychology which we relate to because we relate to the dilemma of the fallenness that he's feeling. But what we don't join in at this point is something sacred. Is it good art? Yeah, it is. It is good art. I don't mind it as a modernist piece. I don't mind it because I think it says something powerful. I think it says something that um, we can uh, relate to about the human condition. But I think it's a symptom, and you can see it in the style of the painting, in the subject matter of the painting, in the psychology of the painting, what you see is this um, loss of society's perspective and that pull in the materialist direction getting very, very strong. To make it really, really apparent, um, check out these. You're familiar with uh, the theatre, I, I, I trust. Uh, there's several of them. There's Michelangelo's. There's uh, Van Van Gogh, if you like, um, where it almost looks like him as the figure of Christ. I might even have it here. Just give me a moment. Yes, I do. There you are. Van Gogh, who was a very religious man. In fact, he was a late preacher before he became an artist. There you see him doing a version of Delacroix's Pierre. What you'll notice about this Pierre that's different from Michelangelo's, though, is what is the Virgin Mary doing? She's not in, in the Michelangelo's Pierre. There is, there is a, a loose hand, but there is a definite holding of the body of Christ, whereas here it is loose. Delacroix, he was loose because of the same reason of his depiction of, of the calming of the storm of Galilee, because he's not sure anymore. And Van Gogh has essentially done his own version of that and retained that because he's not sure either, but for very different reasons, because he's not sure he's worthy, which is why if you look at the figure of Christ, what do you see? It almost looks like a self-portrait of Van Gogh. But compare it to this. I don't even bother digesting who the artist is. This, there's a the end for you. Pure politics, ideology, a political statement. Yes, this may look familiar to you. It's called the Pieta. But it's called the Pieta mockingly because it's about getting Christ out of the picture. Christ has been replaced with the politics of the hour, refugee children on beaches, and we need to assume the position of God and we need to take matters into our own hands because God doesn't matter anymore. And so you can see with, with the way in which the PMs evolved there, how we've gone from something centred entirely upon the sacred to something, let's go back to Vogel, where he said how it degenerates to the point where you end up with pure ideology and emotion, which is what you see. Even the colour schemes change, where it's a kaleidoscope of colour representing this spray, this spew of emotive energy from the artist as opposed to the pure crystalline white of Michelangelo's marble sculpture, which was making a statement of utter purity, perfection and absolute truth in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Whether he held that inside his own mind or not, I'm not sure. This last one I'll show you. Anyone recognise what that is? What, what is being depicted there? Anyone want to guess? What is it? What do you recognise? Anyone? The title of that is The Last Summer by Rothko. Rothko um, undertook some 
religious subjects, but most of his are sort of like blocks. You see paintings around with this like a block of orange on a block of, of black, like two bricks. He, he knew something was wrong, very inspired by Nietzsche, and, and he, he didn't like the age. He thought there was something dysfunctional. He thought there was no spirit. But where did he go looking for it? And this picture shows it clearly, because when he delves into the sacred, he's not in touch with the sacred. He's fumbling with spirit. When he's trying to strip art back and say, no, two blocks of colour, I want to get back to the essence of art. But where's he looking for this spirit? He's looking for the spirit inside humanity. He's expecting the transcendental to be completely and utterly subsumed by the material and all the answers to be therein. By my own hands I will make my transcendent. That's what Rothko is saying, which is why in that picture the Last Supper comes across as so utterly, utterly default. Has it made sense so far? Because I need to wrap it up. Everyone follow? Let me, let me just say one last thing to, for utter completeness, because I promised you I'd say, what can you do? What are the things that you can do in five minutes' time to make a difference? Let me keep this as succinct as I can, and I'll be quick. First of all, education. Educate yourself, educate your children. Take part in art. Make it part of your life. Don't have people walk in the hallway to your house and have a giant picture of yourself or your, you and your touched up pictures from your wedding six by six feet on them. No, save that as a boutique thing on the dresser or, 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 or in your bedroom. Hallways and wall space are for art and introduce it to your children and talk to them about it. And the more you have to teach them, the more you'll teach yourself. The next thing is rebel. Rebel. Fight back. Have demand art. Be active as a parent when it comes to the school and how they teach your children. Be noisy about things. When I go to the art gallery, I'm not quiet. When my children say to me in the gallery of New South Wales, hang on, hang on, this used to be on the Western painting section. Why have they put up all these awkward displays in our way about seats and things and, and island cultures and all that sort of stuff? I just loudly turn around to crease even more furrows into the um, woke boomer brow, it's because they're trying to distract us from our own art, children. Look how great it is. In fact, maybe they put it here so we could do a comparison and let me show you. <laughs> be loud and proud. Be active about it. Get in people's face. Support artists. Support traditional artists. You should be making sure that Dominic Perrottet is more interested in, instead of hanging up different flags, he should be hanging up something painted by um, Mira Haralovic or Beth Wells, someone who's a true traditional artist, instead um, of, of grandstanding the ideology of politics. And finally, demand public art. Demand it of the political class, demand it of the institutions, demand it of the donors. You know, don't fall for the line you're always fed, which is, oh, it's the left, it's the left, oh, the way, the left, the left, it's not the left, it's the right. When you look to the left of the artists, but the right are the ones doing it. Look at me, if you don't believe me, walk in the art gallery of New South Wales, walk through and go, look at all this, look, look at all this rubbish here, look at all this modernist, totally desacralized stuff that is aggressive towards my faith and my civilization, and then look at the donors board, and then look who's paying for it, and you spot the lefty. You won't find one. You will find entrepreneurs. You'll find millionaires. You'll find decorated conservative Australians. And when the new wing has opened up, you'll see Dominic Perrottet with a big pair of scissors going, click, isn't this marvellous? And he signed every single cheque as treasurer for every bit of that art. So when you look at it and you say, look at this thing that looks like a macerated testicle called the effects of colonialism, 
who put that there? Don't forget who wrote the check. Don't tell me for five seconds it's the left, it's the left. Yes, a lefty sculpted the thing, but everybody else made sure it got there and got the accolades and, and displaced somebody else's piece of work. So when you leave here, remember the sacred and the transcendental, and when you look at art and you educate yourself and others about it, make sure that it is in your eye as the beholder. And when you go out into that world, get mad, get angry, get smart, and get even. Thank <laughs> you.